morning, everybody. Um, as you know, yesterday the lecture wasn't uh, completed, but uh, Frédéric will uh, introduce the, the, uh, the tutorial uh, this afternoon and tomorrow with uh, the, the little bit that was left uh, that he wanted to cover before, before finishing. So I think it makes more sense. And so this morning we start right away with uh, Chris Arich. And I leave the floor to, to you, Chris. Come on up. Thank you. I haven't said anything yet. I should wait. <laughs> um, OK, so thank you very much for the invitation to speak um, here. Um, I understand the room is sort of split between um, people from the astrophysics community and people from the solar system community. So um, I was asked, originally asked to speak about errors and uncertainties in particle measurements. Um, so what, I have, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little, at times, in, in some more general terms about the treatment of spectra. And I know you talk, talked about spectra yesterday, um, but the spectra here that I'm talking about are um, distributions in energy, distributions in wavelength. So that's what I'm going to be speaking to today. Um, what I am going to be talking about are the, the sort of the general ideas. And what I want to do the focus the, two, the, the practical session on is more an in-depth exploration of that um, with some synthetic data. So that's where, that's just to set the, the scene here. Um, so most of this, um, what I'm going to be talking about today are, <clears throat> excuse me, are about detectors that count things. So the, um, the values that we deal with have been uh, obtain from a counting measurement. So we, to start with an, a more astrophysical application, we might think of a spectroimager. It might measure the brightness from a range of arrival directions around a spacecraft, giving you a 2D picture. Um, and that then might be across a range of wavelengths to give you a 3D data set as a function of two angles, and a, an azimuthal angle, a polar angle. So in this sort of space, and then in wavelength. For a particle detector, we might be measuring the flux of particles from a range of arrival directions in space um, and as a function of energy, or more specifically, energy per charge in, the, in, in terms of the sorts of instruments that I'm going to be talking about. So again, we have a 3D data set. We, the measurement space then is typically broken up into smaller elements. So we, I will refer to those unapologetically as pixels. Um, so they, in, in this case, we might have um, some um, breakdown in terms of the azimuthal. So we have an azimuthal resolution in our pixels. They might have a polar resolution, an elevation resolution, um, and a wavelength resolution in terms of a spectrometer. Or if we think about a particle detector, there will be, a, again, these uncertainties, uh, these, these resolution um, uh, values uh, in terms of the spatial, but then there will also be an energy resolution. So there are some commonalities there. So for each pixel that we have in our, um, in our detector or um, each measurement bin, if you like, we, the, the count rate that we will get, that we will measure, will be proportional to the flux of particles coming in. Now, now this can be particles, it can be photons, whatever that part of the, whatever that detector is designed to pick up. So we have some relationship between the flux of whatever we're dealing with, so photons, electrons, ions, um, heavy molecular neutrals, even charged dust particles. So we have this flux of those, part, those particles through the, the, through the detector optics onto a, a detecting device. And then the mean count rate that that detector will record will be related to that flux. And the relationship between the two um, is basically a factor that accounts for the design of the instrument, the design of the optics, um, the geometry of the instrument. And we usually call that a geometric factor. So that's given by the G here. And then there will also be an efficiency factor which is sort of the quantum efficiency, which relates the incoming flux that actually reaches the detector itself, 
having traveled through the optics, so it reaches the detector itself. So from that incoming flux, how, you know, the incoming particles that are onto that detector, what fraction of which, uh, what fraction are actually detected and passed through as a, as a count. So quite often you will see these rolled together. So we can talk about a, yeah, an energy dependent or a wavelength dependent geometry, um, but quite more formally we can separate the two out. This uh, relationship, going from a mean count rate in counts per second um, through from the flux, um, is, is this gives us the mean count rate that we would expect from ultimately the Poisson distribution that's, that's modeling each pixel. Um, but the actual uh, number of counts that we get in an observation period or an accumulation time, um, those of you who are dealing with astronomical spectra and images might think of that as an integration time. This is how long a pixel is staring at that flux and accumulating uh, counts. So we get that from the counts per second mean count rate by multiplying by that accumulation time that integration time, and I'm going to call the integration time tau at the bottom here. So this is, so this is sort of setting the scene. Um, now, in particular, to think about the, the particle data sets that we are looking at, that what we are ultimately trying to measure is the phase space distribution of the, of the particle positions and velocities, or positions and momenta, depending on what, um, what space you want to think in. So we want to understand these, particularly, we want to understand the distribution of particles in velocity space. We want to know what directions are the particles going in. Um, so you can relate this, if this is a new idea for you, you can relate that to the, the idea of a phase portrait for a pendulum. So if we start a pendulum out with zero velocity, but maximal extension, it will start moving in the opposite direction, reducing the speed down to, to increasing the speed to a maximum. The position reaches zero at the center, and then we will swap. And so we can, have, we can think about this using this phase portrait up here. So the particle starts out with a maximum position in, in x and zero velocity. And then as the pendulum starts to swing back in that direction, its position will start to move back towards the center, and its velocity will be negative. And then as it reaches the zero line, the center of the oscillation, the speed will be a maximum, and then we will go through to the opposite end of the extension, where the, the velocity will be um, zero again. And so we can see that we have a, uh, a distribution of velocities here. So if we only had one... Um, one, um, we could think of this as, as one particle, it would be at its, velocity, its position in velocity space would be moving around. And so effectively, you can take that analogy and think about that, or what if we have a collection of particles in a space environment or even in the, the air in the room, we can say, uh, it's, what is the distribution of velocities of those particles? Um, and some of that will be made up of some of that velocity will be made up of the random thermal motions in the room, and some of it will be composed of a bulk motion of the particles moving in one direction on mass. So you can think about that as your mean and your standard deviation for that distribution. But that's what we're ultimately trying to measure. Um, and this, the, we can then, if we can measure the um, velocity distribution of the particles in phase space, we can then compare that with various analytical distributions. So uh, we can use a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. I'll use the term Maxwellian in this talk, but so if you are you more used to Maxwell-Boltzmann, do the translation. Um, we could think about Kappa distribution, which is, has a, a Maxwellian at lower energies, but then has a power law tail. Um, those of you who have more of an astrophysical background, maybe extreme astrophysics, you might think of, of, of just, just a power law distribution um, in energy. Um, and so that's the sort of thing we want to try and extract from these observations. Um, I think it's important to point out that um, although the Maxwellian is our go-to analytical distribution, the, whenever, wherever we look in space plasmas, we don't see Maxwellians. We see populations with power law tails. So that's, I think, an important uh, thing to, to recognize and to think about, and I'm going to mention that later on probably in the second half of the talk. Um, so ultimately, the, the thing that we're measuring 
is the number of particles in some infinitesimal volume in phase space. Um, so we think about, well, I'm going to start, if I express this uh, just in terms of a position and then three components of a three-dimensional velocity vector expressed in spherical coordinates, I will start at, I will be measuring the number of particles, or I'm seeking to measure the number of particles um, in this infinitesimal volume. And so this gives us the idea of a phase space density. So this is the number of particles per unit volume in phase space. And that's ultimately the thing we're measuring. Um, so we can uh, express that where F here is the actual velocity distribution of the particles with our two, um, two differential elements and re-expressing the dV um, in spherical coordinates. Um, so let's, uh, moving away from the abstract, let's think about uh, the, the real situation or something more, more realistic. Um, so what we have here is, is a schematic showing um, a two-dimensional slice in velocity space in the vx and the vy. So let's pretend that the vx direction, let's pretend that we are um, on a spacecraft and that spacecraft has a coordinate system where the x direction points towards the sun um, and the y direction is in, is in some other direction perpendicular to that. The concentric rings centered on the origin here, so these are the blue concentric rings here centered on the origin. This um, sketches out the energy, uh, the, the, the velocity distribution that we can see around the spacecraft. So again, it's been, it's been split up into a, um, into a polar grid. So right at the center here, this is our sort of zero velocity. But within this segment here, we are mapping out a volume of phase space. And that gives us a, a certain um, sort of midpoint in, in the speed of the particles and a certain polar angle of velocity space. So that's what we can see within each of these segments. That is what the instrument can see. That's what the instrument can measure. So if we see a lot of particles in this particular cell of phase space, that would tell us that we have particles moving at a whatever speed this happens to be, and they're generally moving in that direction. So obviously, we want to be able to measure all the way around this distribution. Now, the red is what we might expect from a, so from a solo end beam. So this beam is moving away from the sun, um, so it's obviously in the negative part of this space. Um, and it occupies a, a small part of this phase space volume compared to the whole thing that we're measuring. And as we're going to get on to later, you can see that actually compared to the fairly coarse resolution, at least in, um, in angle, this beam is actually quite narrow compared to that, the coarseness of that resolution. And that's one of the critical problems that we have to address when we're trying to analyze these distributions. So this, the red thing here is a contours of a distribution that we want to try and measure. So the highest phase space density in the center, then slower, smaller, and then very, very low, probably below the detection limit for the instrument. So you can see that if we were measuring this ion beam with this configuration of cells, these velocity space volumes, these finite velocity space vol volumes that the instrument can, can measure because it measures in, dis in discrete finite sized bins in angle and energy. Um, you can see that basically most of this ion beam would fall within this velocity element, this velocity space element in the instrument. So that's, this, is the, this is the sort of thing we want to try and measure. This is where I'm coming from. So there are many different types of particle detector. They depend uh, on the nature of the particle and the energy range of interest. So the sort of detectors that I'm going to focus on today are, electro are known as electrostatic analyzers. And in an electrostatic analyzer, we use um, electric fields, potential differences to um, select um, narrow ranges in energy per charge. And we can focus those down onto some sort of detector to count the particles. So that could be a microchannel plate detector. It could be a silicon detector. 
Um, and there are two, different, two main types of those detectors. There are curved plate analyzers and retarding potential analyzers. I'm only going to cover the first one in this talk, and I'll show you a, a sketch of one of those in the next slide. And we do have detectors that um, uh, measure neutrals. They will often ionize the, the incoming neutral before detections in an electrostat electrostatic analyzer. So the neutrals come in, they, there will be some method to ionize them, and then they will enter an electrostatic part, maybe even an electrostatic analyzer, to do the final detection and, and measurement of the incoming energy or incoming velocity. Um, energetic particle detectors often use um, different techniques. So particles might go through a stack of silicon detectors arranged in a, in a sort of a cylindrical configuration. And you have multiple uh, slices of silicon. And which detectors those particles ultimately travel through and which ones they stop in will then determine their energy. Um, and that's known as the, 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 the mapping between the combination of detectors and the particle energy is known as channel logic. And of course, that also in, 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 uh, injects its own source of error there uh, as well. So let's think about some of these curved plate electrostatic analyzers. Um, so this, um, this uh, diagram shows you the general configuration of one of these analyzers. Um, we, the, the curved plate comes about because this surface, the inner, this inner surface here and this outer surface are um, essentially concentric hemispheres that nestle within each other. Um, and there is a narrow gap between those two hemispheres. And a potential difference is applied between those two hemispheres. So there is an electric field existing between the inner and the outer hemisphere. And so the entrance, actual entrance aperture for the particles is at the top here. So the particles will come in and then they will start to sense the electric field, and then they will be pulled into a curved trajectory to hit the detector down here. They can come in from both directions, and they'll just hit different detectors that are arranged in azimuth. So this um, viewpoint looking down is what you get when you see this. So these and this and this are two opposite detectors. Uh, in this uh, uh, radial arrangement, circular arrangement. If the particle is moving um, too fast, so if its energy per charge is too great, then the electric field that exists between these two plates will not be enough to pull it into a curved trajectory, and it will slam into the outer wall. If the, en if the incoming energy per charge is too low, then it will be pulled to the inner hemisphere. And so only a, a, a range of energies per charge that match the potential difference here will follow a trajectory that's undisturbed down to meet the detector at the bottom. So that's how the, the optical part of it works. This is how we select what part of um, energy, or effectively energy per charge space, that we measure. And I say energy per charge, because um, it's the selection here is based on this potential difference. So that potential difference is directly proportional to the range of energy per charge that we get through down to um, the detector. Um, so that's um, for electrons, it's fairly obvious. And, and that's why I will occasionally slip into saying energy rather than energy per charge. Um, but uh, this is important for um, detectors that measure ions, because the ions may be multiply charged. So we might have, um, a, a, in the solar wind, for example, we might have protons coming in. They have uh, a particular energy. They will have a single charge. Um, but we might get uh, doubly ionized helium, which has two charges. So we have uh, a, two in, a two underneath there. So this, this does matter, particularly for ions. The, this angle here is um, essentially one of the angular resolutions for the instrument. And so if, an, uh, if a, a particle will come in outside of that angle, then it will be basically hit one of the surfaces of this collimator here. And so you simply won't get that into the instrument. So this sets an, one of the other um, uh, resolution aspects of the instrument. So the other uh, part of the geometry here is the resolution around. So this, these are split, each one of these is a pixel, and the width of this pixel in angle 
determines the, uh, the resolution in the theta direction. So this determines the, direction in the, the, the resolution in the phi direction. This determines the resolution in the polar or elevation direction. So if we were to look down on this analyzer, um, here is the, the curved trajectory of the particle down to the detector. If the particle is coming from over here, then it will reach that detector. If it's coming from over here, it would reach that detector. If it was coming from your direction, it would reach a detector on the other side of the board, and vice versa. So on the sketch down, down here, we can see that these particles are focused down onto a particular detector, there and there, and so on. Sorry? And the top is circular, yes. So this, is, this whole thing is round like a cylinder. So it's a little bit like the geometry of this. So we have these particles that are doing this. Okay. Um, so, the, so when we, um, in this particular design of instrument, um, what, we would, what the instrument would do is that it would set a particular potential difference between the inner and outer um, hemispheres, and then it would count for a while. Um, so we would then get a certain number of counts for each of these pixels, and then the instrument would shift to another um, potential difference and then do the same exercise again. And so obviously there is a finite amount of time at which this pixel is going to be measuring, is going to be counting. Um, and then if we add all of those up, then we get the total sample time to get an entire spectrum. Um, that gives us uh, a distribution in uh, energy, and in the polar angle theta. So that gives us a 2D distribution. Then if we keep repeating that measurement, we then explore a wider range of azimuthal angles. A, possibly as the, uh, the entrance aperture for the instrument is moved physically, um, so that I sweep out a range of azimuthal angles over, over time. Um, so that might be the case if an instrument was located on a, a three-axis stabilized spacecraft, for example. If, alternatively, the spacecraft was, was rotating, um, like, uh, like cluster, for example, then the instrument would have a certain look direction, and then we would sweep that around with the rotation of the spacecraft all the time, measuring in, pole, in the polar direction. So my, my uh, pixels there would be arranged measuring this direction, and then I would sweep around to get the other uh, dimension for the distribution. But it's, it's clear that the, um, the, rote, the, the uh, azimuthal look direction is changing throughout the whole measurement. So if we were to look um, at um, the energy per charge versus azimuth, so this, this sketch is a little confusing to get your head around. What we have each row here is a different energy per charge bin in the instrument. And where it's colored purple is where a, an, an accumulation is happening. So we start out at time zero. We're looking in one particular azimuth, one particular azimuthal direction, and we do some counting. We count for a certain accumulation time, and we accumulate these counts here. And then we move to the next, so that the analyzer changes to a different potential difference to admit a different range of energies per charge, and then it counts again, and then it does it again and again. The, um, at each time, after each, at each time, the spacecraft is now looking at a different azimuthal direction. So if we think about something that is slowly turning, and I start by, by measuring in that azimuthal direction over there, and I accumulate for, let's say, a second. So I'm measuring for a second, and now I'm pointing over here, and then I start with the next energy up, and then I count for another second, and then I move to the next energy up, and I count for another second. So I'm not measuring the um, energy per charge of the incoming particles in the same direction. It's constantly changing, so that there is sort of this drift in what direction in, in the coverage of azimuth and energy space. So I'm missing certain parts of this distribution, and we're going to come back to that later on. But the, um, the, um, these, when, when these instruments are designed, you look at the environment the spacecraft is going to be in, the target science environment, what are the science questions, um, 
is the spacecraft going is spinning? If it's spinning, how quickly is it spinning? And these are the sorts of questions that then allow you to sort of minimize this so that we typically would say, well, this whole thing, I'm measuring an azimuth, and this entire energy per charge space has been sampled at a fixed angle. And so you make that assumption that actually the, the distribution that you're measuring hasn't changed at all in this slice of azimuth that you're measuring. But that's an assumption that you're making, and it's important to recognize that when you're looking at the data. Um, I would also just say here that you notice that some of these cells have, uh, are the same, and that's because there's, there's no restriction on these uh, cells covering exactly the same range of energy per charge. They can change, and in fact, they do change. Um, so typically, we'll, we might have a finer resolution at lower energies, which will get coarser as you move to higher energies. And you can say you could make the same statement about a, um, um, a, a, a spectral, spectral imager. You might have different wavelength resolutions at different parts of the spectrum. So there are similar, similar issues here. And as, we're going, as I'm going to talk about later, I'll come back to this in the context of spectral images and talk about how if you're taking a, an, an image and you're scanning a, um, the slit of a spectrum across a target, then you're not necessarily taking, you're not necessarily taking the spectrum instantaneously across the entire target. And so if, this, if the population has changed over that integration time, then you'll be getting an aliasing issue. Okay, so I thought it was interesting and useful to talk about some data and actually show you some of what this data is, particularly those that are not in a, in a solar system or particle detector context. Um, this is some data from the Cassini spacecraft. This is uh, data that's measuring um, uh, electrons. Um, we have two different units in the spectrogram at the top. So um, this is data from a single pixel of an instrument of the Cassini instrument. It's scanning through all of the energies per charge down from about half an electron volt per charge up to about 25 um, kilo electron volts per charge. Um, it's doing that roughly every two seconds. And the instrument is mounted on a, um, on a platform such that if we say that that's the entrance aperture for that pixel, this instrument is doing this every four minutes. So we're sweeping out a range of azimuths every four minutes as we're sweeping through the energy per charge space. Okay. So we would collect one of a single spectrum, a single slice in this two seconds. So we would measure a spectrum here, we'd measure a spectrum here, we'd measure a spectrum here, 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 and then we would go back. And that's what I'm showing you in these spectrograms. The top figure shows you um, the spectrum in units of count rate. So this is the counts per second that I talked to you about. So this is not the counts in a particular accumulation or integration time for the instrument. This is just the, the once you've uh, transformed that back into the counts per second. Um, you'll notice that there are a number of features in this distribution, and some of which I'll come back to later and I won't dwell on right now. Um, I will say from the outset that this at the bottom is, is, um, is a systematic issue that you need to account for when you're analyzing these distributions. You will see um, these, some of the striping here. Some of the striping is physical, some of it is not. Um, you will see that if I can come over here, we will, you might be able to pick out that some of these, um, there are some uh, low count spikes up here. Again, I will talk about that later. You can see it You can see them particularly here, 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 and here. Those are because of mode changes in the instrument where there's more or less averaging happening, and that's uh, simply a consequence of, this, of the instrument and the spacecraft ma managing the data volume allowance that it has. Um, and then you've got the, the real population, the, the actual ambient electron population over the top. So these, these are the things that we want to measure. These, these are the electrons where we want to measure the velocity space distribution of. And you can see that the flux is... Ve and if so if we, if we go to the next panel, this is what happens when we take that count rate and transform it to flux using the geometric factor and the efficiency for the instrument itself. 
You can see that the flux generally varies with time. It's, it's higher in some places, lower in others, very low in other circumstances. Um, I will uh, talk a little about the, this black line uh, uh, shortly, but you'll, one thing that you can see between this figure and this figure is that the, um, there is no upturn in, this, in the flux, in, in the count here, but there is here. So you can see that the, the counts go from low to high, but that's not, the flux goes from low to high, and it doesn't happen here. That's because uh, this is contaminated, this, this spectrum is contaminated with noise, and the particular properties of the geometric factor and the efficiency mean that this gives you this enhancement in flux, which is highly artificial. Um, and so what's plotted uh, over plotted here is the estimated temperature of these electrons. And you can see that the electron temperature goes up here. And this is an artificial effect because the noise hasn't been removed in these measurements in this, for this, this particular calculation of the electron temperature. And that's, so that's in something important that we're going to come back to. And it's something that um, you'll be able to play around with during the, the tutorial session this afternoon. Um, just to go briefly to these, um, these two, product, two panels here, this is the elect an estimate of the electron density, and this is an estimate of the electron temperature. Um, you can see um, that there is lots of structure here. You can see here that there are some oscillations there. You can see quite extreme oscillations here. Um, the oscillations there are... Um, they're in the data. They're not an, an, an artifact of the, of the measurement per se. They're reflecting the assumptions that have been made to calculate this, and they're reflecting the, um, the way that the data has been collected. Um, but we, we'll talk about that later on. OK, so um, let's, let's move on, and let's just talk a little bit more about how these look in, um, in data. So these are electrons. Um, the, in this region, this is, this is data from Saturn's magnetosphere, like I said, from Cassini. And in this region of the magnetosphere, the bulk velocity of the plasma is actually quite low. The bulk velocity is, is of the order of tens of kilometers per second up to about 100 kilometers per second, but not really exceeding that very much. Um, in contrast, the thermal velocity is very large. So the ratio between the bulk speed and the thermal speed is really small. Um, this puts this electron measurement in what's known as a subsonic regime. Um, that doesn't mean that that's not an expression of um, something being of moving faster than sound speed. It's an expression of how the data is expressed. And I'm going to illustrate that by showing you some slices, some synthetic slices for a maxwell boltzmann distribution uh, just looking in the energy per charge space. So, <clears throat> Sorry. yes. That's not how it works, but you could do that if you wanted to. There's nothing, from a, an instrument design point of view, there's nothing to stop you doing that. Um, it's because um, the... What's changing the, the most rapidly? We want a... Um, typically, we want, really want to know the uh, energy per charge distribution of the particles. We want to get their distribution in, in essentially energy or speed. Um, but we also want to know what their distribution is around. 
So, um, yes, you could point in one direction, just look at one energy per charge and, and then keep doing that. So you would say, I'm going to measure an energy per charge of one volt, and I'm going to do that at all of these different positions, and then I'm going to go to energy per charge uh, of two volts and go backwards and then so on. Um, the energy per charge distribution might have changed during that time, and or quite often the primary thing that we want to know is the actual energy per charge distribution as a, as a primary quantity, and then pick apart the, the azimuthal dependence. Um, the azimuthal and spatial dependence is, um, can tell you about um, the speed, uh, sorry, the, the direction of a flow, or it can tell you about an anisotropy of a population. Um, you might say, well, that's going to be more constant over, the, over a range of, in, of, a, of a time of interest. Um, there's also a, there's a, I think there's also an instrumental um, argument for saying it's easier to step through um, the sequence. No, 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 actually, no, ignore that. Yeah. There, there's no instrumental reason why you couldn't do that. Um, but we want to measure the energy per charge spectrum, and then we'll measure that sequentially at different azimuths. Um, to, av to avoid any issues. It is selected, and there is a table of energies, energy per charges. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. They're, they're everywhere, yeah. Lots and lots of space missions use them. Yeah. So, um, so the, the way that the data is expressed can tell you something about um, the, the, the properties of the particles. So I'm looking at um, this distribution here, and um, because I have spent a long time looking at these data, um, I know that roughly the thermal energy of this population of particles is a few hundred electron volts. And from the estimate of the temperature, you can see that's roughly the case. Um, I know that because typically with electrons, we're looking at a subsonic distribution. The thermal speed is much, much larger than the bulk speed. So when you look at the distributions of energies per charge, what you're looking at is a measure of the, the thermal kinetic energy of the particles. You're looking at a distribution of the thermal kinetic energy of the particles. If I'm in the, the sonic regime, so this is the case when you're in the solar wind, the, uh, and, well, this is the case when you're looking at uh, ions in the solar wind, the bulk speed of the ions is of the same order or larger than the thermal speed of the ions. And so they appear very differently in the spectrum. So if we looked at this, so this is a, a, a plot of the flux of protons at a fixed thermal energy, so a fixed thermal speed, um, but varying the bulk speed. So this, uh, this curve down here, this shows you the flux as a function of energy for protons moving at 10 kilometers per second with a fixed temperature. Um, and then you move to a higher speed of 200 kilometers per second, and the, the spectrum does move up in energy, but it also starts to change its shape. And then when you go to 500 kilometers per second, the beam is now, is now much narrower in, um, compared to what it was before. That's a, so this is in the subsonic regime, and this is in the sonic regime. So what we have here in this subsonic regime is that the peak tells us a lot about the thermal energy of the particles. Um, and we only really see the bulk kinetic energy in small shifts uh, around of that peak. When we go to the supersonic regime, the thermal uh, kinetic energy is uh, about the spread, the thermal spread around the bulk velocity. So here, in this, in this, if we took this to the limit of zero thermal kinetic energy, the peak would tell us just about the bulk kinetic energy, and it would almost look like a delta function in energy per charge. Um, <clears throat> but as the, th as the thermal energy increases, the whole distribution spreads out. 
So we have these, we can think about these two limits, the, the subsonic limit and the supersonic limit. If you're in a subsonic limit, you're looking at the, the peak tells you more about the thermal. If you're in the supersonic limit, the peak tells you about the bulk. Um, in reality, they're always somewhere in between, um, but that gives you a first order look, when, first order idea when you're looking at the data, when you're looking at the spectra, and you're analyzing the spectra. Okay, so um, let's talk about some of the sources of error and uncertainty in these sorts of measurement. Um, I want to talk about um, mainly two issues with these sorts of measurements. One is the noise that we get in these detectors. Um, uh, the other is the systematic errors that we get in the data. Um, so sources of noise that we have, um, and I'll also talk about the, the random errors, the statistical errors, due to counting statistics. Um, but the primary ones that I want to focus on are, are sources of noise in the detector and systematic errors. You can see that there are lots of systematic errors that we can, um, that we can encounter. Um, so I will start with the noise, and then I will flow into the systematic errors. So noise sources give us background counts in our detector. So we can separate out. Um, our measurements, so our measurement of a spectrum in terms of the foreground. So this is a Maxwell-Boltzmann dis distribution. Um, it's in the subsonic regime. It's for electrons. The peak is a few hundred um, EV. So we're looking at a thermal temperature of a few hundred electron volts. Um, so this is our foreground signal. This is the thing that we want to measure. And this tells us about the velocity space distribution of the particles. The red line here. The red line is the background. And this is the thing that we don't want, because as soon as this becomes large compared to, or even if it's not large, the, the, the magnitude of this relative to this can impact the quality of what we can say about the underlying velocity distribution of the particles. Um, so if we looked at one of these spectra, um, for an electrostatic analyzer, and the background is independent of the energy per charge. So that's why it's a straight line here, um, because the, the background hasn't gone through the optical part. It hasn't been filtered by what its incoming energy per charge is. It's come straight into the instrument, through, basically through the walls of the instrument, and triggered the detector. Um, so it's flat in energy per charge. It may vary with pixel, so in the polar direction, um, and it also may vary in azimuth, depending on various circumstances, as we will see. There are different limits to this that we could think about. We could think about the low background limit. So when the mean background, um, in terms of the counts per integration time, per counts per accumulation, is less than or of the order of one. What that gives you is lots of Poisson noise, because this is um, going into a detector that is counting. So the, the counts are described by a Poisson distribution. The, when you only have around about one count per accumulation, that means uh, you could have zero counts, you could have one, you could have two, sometimes three, because of the variance in the Poisson distribution for those means. Um, so that could give you lots and lots of, of noise out here where the, the, the foreground, the signal is low, and the background is relatively high compared to the foreground, and so you end up with lots of noise. You'll see this in the practical exercise this afternoon. Um, in the case of a high background, so this is actually relatively high, I think, but you know, imagine if this line was up here, and all you have is a little bit of foreground peaking above the noise. Um, the mean may be so high that it's really hard to properly remove that and treat that. Um, so imagine that we were interested in how wide this distribution was. If the background was right up here, we would only really get some information about the peak, and it would be really hard to tell anything about uh, down here for the width of the distribution because the noise is so high. Um, there are various mitigation strategies that you can use um, and that people do, so you could just say, I've got a model for this, and I'm going to subtract it. Um, so you take the, the foreground, you subtract the background, and then you just process what's left. 
Um, so you could use, do that off a model. You could do that by saying, I'm going to select a part of the spectrum where basically the foreground is zero, all I'm measuring is background, and I'm going to average over a, over a few um, bins to figure out what the background might be, and then I will subtract that. There are various ways of doing that. Um, you could, if you were fitting a model to this, you could parameterize it with the actual noise level, so you could put that in as a parameter, a fit parameter. You could calculate the signal-to-noise ratio of um, each point in this spectrum. Um, so you can, you can, you've got the foreground. You can estimate that if you can estimate the background, then you can remove the background, divide by that background, and get an estimate of the signal-to-noise. Um, you could average these out. So hopefully that will Im improve um, the foreground at the expense of the background. You could integrate for longer. Um, you, some instruments actually have a background channel built in, which is one of those pixels, if I just skip back to the instrument diagram, that will be one of those pixels where particles can't actually get to. So it will be the particles will be physically blocked, say, from reaching this pixel. And that will be used as a, as a background channel, because you know there's no foreground there, so you know what the background is. So there are some instruments that are designed with that specifically in. And then there are other techniques. So there's a, a, a measurement called coincidence where you basically count the thing twice. And if you, or if you look for counts that occur twice, and if they've occurred twice at the same time, you say, that was real. It wasn't background, because they would occur random. The backgrounds would occur randomly compared to the real signal. So where do we get the noise from? Um, so one particular uh, source of noise is radiation sources on board spacecraft. Um, so this schematic here is of the Voyager spacecraft. Um, and because Voyager was on a, uh, uh, went to large heliocentric distances, or is at large heliocentric distances, they used a, a radioisotope thermoelectric generator for a power source. Um, so that's filled with typically plutonium-238. That's a typical radionuclide that's, that's used. Um, from plutonium-238, you get um, gamma rays from the alpha decay of the plutonium. And you also get a few neutrons from spontaneous fission, these two decay paths. Um, so if a gamma ray comes out of this, detect out of this RTG and strikes a it strikes an instrument, it will go straight through the walls of the instrument, and it can trigger the detector. It will give you a, it will give you a false count. Um, so that's, the efficiency of that process is roughly a few percent. Um, so if you, if you know what the radiation field is around the spacecraft, so you know what the flux of gamma rays is and neutrons um, all the way around the spacecraft, then you can estimate what that background should be. Um, you do need to take into account the fact that um, the gammas and neutrons from this might actually get stopped by parts of the spacecraft structure. Um, so that's a, that's a fact that you need to think about. And that's one of those things that can give you a, um, a background that varies with azimuth. Because if the instrument is articulated, it can, move, it can move around in what is possibly a quite an anisotropic radiation field. So it'll be at certain pa parts of its, of its motion, uh, of its actuation, um, it can be moved into a region where the radiation field is higher, more intense, so the background is higher, and then as it moves away, it can move into a region where it's more shielded, and then the background becomes lower. And you need to understand that to remove. Yes? I, I, sure. I, mean, I was thinking about this as I was putting these slides together. Um, I, you could think about this as a source of systematic error, that it's something that's in there that you don't want. It's a bias, um, and you need to remove it. But um, I would then also say that that then introduces a measure of uncertainty, because if I move backwards, if I take up to this, for example, um, I can calculate what the uncertainty is in a... So if I'm, if I'm out here, for example, and I take this measurement, I have 
let's say, eight counts per accumulation I've measured, um, the, the counting statistical um, error on that, the, the random error, is going to be the square root of that. So is that two and a half or something like that? Um, when I, um, if I've got a model for the background, um, I might say, well, that is basically all background. Um, now let's so, so that's my 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 um, the count per accumulation of my background is two and a half. So that's effectively my my systematic error. I don't want that. Um, that is a, a, a true error, if you like. <laughs> um, but it has some random variation in it that's a source of uncertainty. So when I go to subtract that from up here, um, so I will. So here the counts per accumulation is much higher. The, um, the relative uncertainty is then smaller because the error goes as a square root. I, I'm just going to talk about that shortly. Um, but then I want to subtract off that two and a half, half counts per accumulation. That would be relative uncertainty on that is quite high. And so that's then a source of uncertainty in the, in the, in the subtracted. Um, so I think it's, it's actually both. It's a source of error and it's a source of uncertainty. Um, I think you're right that errors and uncertainties are, are conflated. Um, I conflate them myself when I'm talking in, in, in generally. Um, but I, the, you can, I think you can separate them out into what is an actual, um, what is a systematic error that I need to remove? And does that systematic error introduce a source of uncertainty into the measurement itself? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I guess I classify this as um, what is, where do I account for this? And do I account for it in multiple places? So I, I could account for this in, I could account for the systematic part by subtracting it. And then I have subtracted that, but I want to get a measure of uncertainty on the final count rate. And so I would then also fold that into my measurement of uncertainty of that count rate. And then I would propagate that measure of uncertainty through to my final flux. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And that is why I showed both um, plots here, because I think you need, to, you need to know what the raw data is in order to understand what some of the effects are in the calibrated data and the data that's in the physical units. If you're, if, and and, you, and you're, you, data products are released, and they might just be in terms of this. They might just be in units of flux. But I think that, and that might be sufficient for let's say, in everyday use, where you just want to know well, what is the electron, rough electron energy. But I think we are now in a... I think we are now in an era where we are making really quite precision measurements in space. Um, there are things like multiple spacecraft um, uh, measurements where you... Where, I mean, the folks who've looked at cluster in the room and probably MMS will know that you're, you're looking at differences between spacecraft and you're trying to reconstruct gradients. And there, I think that that's, a, that's more of an edge case. It's more of a corner problem that um, you, where you, you need to know some of this stuff in order to be able to assess what impact some of the uncertainty has on the measurement. So I think that, yes, it's fine to release a product like this, but ultimately you need some of the raw data as well to, figure, to go work backwards and figure out what the impact might be on your data. Uh, partic particularly, what I'm particularly worried about is the impact of the systematics. You can remove a lot of it, but I think a lot of the systematics are not suited, generally suited to a large-scale pipeline of going from some raw data to a product. I think you know, when you get into those corner cases, you need to do the custom analysis. You need to dig into the data to extract the very best that you can from it. You need to really get into the details of those systematics and the uncertainties. Is that, is that okay? Yeah? Okay.
Okay, so um, those are the, that's, the, that's one source of noise. Um, there is another source of noise to do with radiation, and that's actually within the detector itself. This can be a, a much smaller source of noise, but it's important all the same. Um, if we're dealing with a particularly an electric, uh, a microchannel plate detector, um, they are made from ceramics and they contain um, radioactive impurities. So the particular offenders here are uranium-238, thorium-232, and potassium-40. Um, so they will undergo radioactive decay in the detector itself. That will generate a few random counts every so often. So that's another source of background. Um, so there are some detectors. So in, in fundamental physics, where they want really high precision, low noise measurements, they have to use very high purity glass to reduce the radionuclide content so that they reduce that noise flow. Um, I guess this also would apply if you were thinking about um, the materials you were constructing the instrument from. Um, you know, since nuclear testing started, steel is basically, or a pure steel is steel without any radioactive contamination is quite a rare thing. And so if you're incorporating some of that into your instrument, you might have another source of background. So it's important to understand these things. So just to actually look at what that might look like in data, this is data from Cassini's um, electron detector. This is the same instrument that I showed you the spectrogram from. What we're looking at, at the on the top panel is the count. So this is a function of time. And we're looking at the count rate at the top there. And you can see it has this sort of quasi sinusoidal character to it. You can also see that uh, there are periods where it's noisier and periods where it's more smoothed. Um, you might be able to see that this angle here correlates with that sinusoid at the top. And so this, uh, this panel actually shows you the orientation of the sensor around the spacecraft. So this is this sweeping effect of the sensor being swept across the sky so we can increase the spatial resolution of our measurements. So we sweep the detector across the sky. And as it moves into one direction, the, radi the, the background gets higher, the counts go up, and as it moves down to the other direction, the counts get lower, and so on. And this, um, when you take um, measurements of the radiation field from Cassini's um, RTGs, it's radioisotope thermoelectric generators, and you combine that with what you would expect for the efficiency of an MCP to, a, to a, a gamma ray, then you get this sort of sinusoidal variation. And so this is, you're, you're basically seeing um, alpha decays in the plutonium in the RTGs from this background. Um, the, uh, the reason why it's going noisy and smoother is because this is two different modes. So you can see when it's in what's labeled as mode two, it's noisier, when it goes to mode four, it's less noisy, and so on. And that's because the instrument internally is averaging the, um, is averaging the noise. So um, we talked about Poisson statistics. This could be um, the scatter there is because you've got a, a noise level that's around about one count per accumulation. So within an accumulation, that could be one, it could be two, it could be three, it could be zero. So that gives you lots of fluctuation. But then when you start averaging that down, you end up with something that smooths out. And, and as you take a longer integration interval, it will ultimately tend to the, the mean count rate, the mean background count rate that you would expect. Um, so this poses a, a, a challenge. And you, yes? The integration time is the same, but you're taking multiple measurements and you're averaging them together. Yeah. So that's automatically smoothing out the, the variation. Another source of noise that we have is from um, cosmic rays and penetrating radiation. So if I show you this movie from... Um, oh. Is that going to work for me? Possibly not. Oh, yes, it is. Good. So um, this is a CME, and you see shortly afterwards, you see lots of speckle on the, on the image. 
This is a CCD, but the same effect is happening, that charged particles are going through the instrument housing um, and triggering the detector, giving you a source of systematic error, and also, if you subtract that, it would give you a source of noise, uh, a source of uh, uncertainty as well. So the point here is that charged particles with sufficient energy can get inside the instrument, just like they can with the radiation source on the spacecraft. Um, so the, the example is cosmic rays here, solar energetic protons, and electrons in planetary radiation belts will also do the same. Um, for for a, you, you can use calculations to figure out what energy particles there might be. So um, a given material and a given thickness of that material will be able to stop particles of a particular energy. So the idea is that as a particle is, is hits the side of the, the instrument or hits a, 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 the metal casing, as it goes through the casing, it will start to lose, it will lose energy as it penetrates through. And so eventually it will get to a point where it's just completely stopped. So this is like half thickness for penetration of particles through a target. Um, so you can do those calculations, and this, is, this plot down here is a calculation um, from uh, the model called E-Star. You can get to this from the NIST website. And this is as a function of the energy of the incoming particle. These are in units of MeV. This shows you the range that that particle will penetrate to. Um, so uh, as you would intuitively expect, as you get to higher and higher energies, so like a 100 MeV electron, will penetrate to a much larger distance in, through the material than an, a, a particle with, say, 100 keV would. The, the units are slightly weird here. Um, so we can... I should, have got rid of, I should have got rid of this. But the units are slightly un, uh, unusual. What you need to do is you need to take this range, which is in grams per uh, square centimetre, and divide that by the density of the material. Um, so if you do... So if we take... For example, one gram per square centimetre, we divide by the density of aluminium, 2.7 grams per cubic centimetre, you get something that has dimensions of length. And that happens to be 0.37 um, centimetres. 0.37 metres. So uh, that, what that means is that an electron with an energy of a few MeV will go through... No, that is right, 0.37 centimetres of material before it's stopped. So if your detector has a, uh, a thickness of, let's say, 0.2 centimetres, then two MeV electrons will go straight through. They're not going to be stopped, and that can be your, your source of noise. So you can do these sorts of calculations. If you're seeing a large background, you'll be able to tell what sort of energy ranges have been able to get in to your instrument. And to show you an example of that, this is some more Cassini data showing penetration radiation in Saturn's radiation belts. So these are several different pixels of, um, the, uh, from Cassini. So these are looking in different, slightly different directions. And this is a function of time. The color scale shows you the number of counts that are recorded. And what the spacecraft is doing is it's moving from the edge of the, ra the radiation belt through to the most intense part of the radiation belt. And as you go th into the most dense part of the radiation belt, you, you can see that the color scale goes right up to very high counts. And that's because the uh, energetic electrons in the radiation belts are just piling through the, the walls of the instrument and triggering uh, lots of false counts. And you, so this, this at the over here, this is actually a real, these are real ambient electrons, but you can even see here that the, at this particular location, the background is already quite high. So that's in that, we're approaching that limit that I showed you on the, the line plot, where you have this real population, but the counts, the, the background's really quite high, and so the real distribution is sort of peaking out at the top of it. Uh, and then when you get into this regime here, it's, it's almost completely swamped by by background noise. Um, you can do the same exercise of subtracting, but here you're subtracting something that's really quite large from, so the background is very large compared to the background plus the foreground, and that's really hard then to, you're looking at very small differences, and so you end up with lots of uncertainty in your, in your estimate of the, um, of the actual real counts.
in there. So we breaking for coffee at quarter past? Yeah? Okay. So I will start talking about some, some of the systematics and the random errors now. Um, so these, so this is source of noise. This is a systematic, this is, can be considered a systematic error, but it's also a sort of source of uncertainty for the instrument. But now I want to talk about some of the, um, the systematics that we get. So I've used the term uh, a, a few times in the, uh, in the, these are, the, the counts can be described by Poisson statistics. So the, 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 when, I call it, when I talk about a random error, I um, mean that it's not something that is, um, the instrument has made a mistake. It's not that the, the, mer that the measurement is, uh, is wrong. It's just that, these, the, um, you're not reflecting the natural variability in measurements. And that if you did exactly the same measurements, you would get a slightly different number each time. Um, and that's simply statistical. That's, that's an uncertainty on the measurement. Um, we can't measure it perfectly every time. Because what I'm talking about counting detectors, the, um, the counts recorded by a given pixel for a given accumulation are random variables that follow a Poisson distribution. That's typically the way that we would model them. Um, and so your counts here model by Poisson distribution with a mean count rate of, count rate of lambda. And then we, this is the, the probability distribution for getting a particular um, count C. So, and the, the mean and the variance of that distribution is simply lambda and lambda. So obviously, then the, the, the standard deviation for this is the square root of the count rate. So if we were to think about, well, when we look at a... Um, uh, when we look at the uh, relative error, so we take the, un the, the uncertainty, the random error, and divide that by um, the actual value that was measured, you can see that if I take the square root of lambda and divide it by lambda, I get something that goes down as the count rate goes up. So we have something that is lambda to the minus half. So the, the relative uncertainty as you get more and more counts, uh, goes down, which is a good thing, because that gives you less uncertainty on the distribution itself, on the measurement of your velocity space distribution. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's a good thing. But then, obviously, then you need to fold in the other sources of, uh, of uncertainty there, like the removal of a background that will then, then uh, combine with this fundamental Poisson noise to give us the, the final measurement, the final estimate of the uncertainty on the quantity that we, we're interested in. So one source of, one systematic that is not talked about very much um, and really does give us, uh, introduce an error, is the effect of compression in the data that we send back to Earth. Um, there are main, two main types of, com of, of technique for compressing the data. Um, I would say that this is becoming more pressing with time um, because instruments are capable of collecting far more data now than, than the spacecraft can send back to Earth. So mm, nearly every instrument will do some form of compression on board. Um, so, there are, so there are two different techniques that we can use. We can use either a lossless technique or a lossy technique. Um, you will all have used these at some point. Um, so that in a lossless compression, the data can be recovered exactly. The, there's an in, exact inverse. Um, so you don't lose anything. So anyone who's used a zip file, um, that's, you, that's a lossless compression technique. Um, uh, anyone who's used a fax machine, I don't know if anyone knows what a fax machine is anymore, but um, <laughs> fax machines, <laughs> fax machines they've, you can imagine you know, a piece of white paper with some writing on it. There's lots of, of white space and then only a little bit of text. So you can say all of that white, big white space there, I can just contract that into a couple of numbers. I don't need to send that back because it's all, it's all empty, it's all blank. So that's what... Um, that's an algorithm called run length encoding. You basically look for long um, strings of the same thing. You say, just use three. I need n of those tags. So that's how fax machines compress the data. Um, but lossy, uh, so you will all have used lo a lossy compression um, if you've ever listened to an MP3 or a JPEG. Um, so in those cases, those are lossy compression algorithms. They remove some information, but they usually try and remove it in such a way that 
the, at least in the case of JPEG and MP3, you can't perceive that loss of information. It's not, not perceptible to you. And so that's an irreversible operation. You've lost something. So I've actually shown here, these are three different photographs of myself, because I'm not vain. Um, and what you can see is different levels of JPEG compression. Um, so this is like a really high quality JPEG. And then the same picture, but a very low quality JPEG, which has actually, you've, you've taken the file size down by about, to about 1% of what it is up here. And you can see you've lost a lot of definition. You've lost some of the color information. Um, you can't get, you can never get that back. Um, one simple thing that's done on spacecraft is to, and this is particularly relevant for images, um, and also and spectral information, is to average the data. So I could take an image, let's say I've captured an image that is 512 by 512 pixels in dimension, and then I reduce that down to 256 by 256 by simply averaging sets of four pixels down. Um, so that reduces the file size by a factor of four, or the data volume by a factor of four. Um, you can't get the original intensities of those four pixels back. That information has been lost. Now, there are better techniques to preserve the information while reducing that data volume. Um, and there, there is work going on to, to try and improve that. Um, one of the things that happens to particle data is particle data also gets compressed. Um, and it gets, uh, there are uh, lossless compression algorithms, but there, there is a common lossy compression technique that, that is used as well. Um, so one, one of the, the simple lossy ones is to simply average um, adjacent bins. So we might say, if I go back to this diagram that we have here, I might say I'm going to average um, this entire spectrum with the next one. So I'm now immediately losing azimuthal information that I can never recover. I might say, well, OK, I'm going to actually average these two rows together, and then I'm going to average these two rows together, then these two, and then these two. Again, I've lost information. I can't get those original um, pixel values, independent pixel values back. So that's a source of systematic error. Um, and how you correct for that might introduce additional errors. Um, the, important, the other important thing to say is that it can also affect how the data has been sampled in velocity space, as you would expect. I'm, if I am average these two rows together, I am now n reducing um, my um, azimuthal sampling. I'm re reducing my um, energy sampling. So I'm changing that fundamental. That's not just a fact of I've lost a bit of information. It's fundamentally changing how much of the velocity space I've sampled. It's the same thing when I look, look at a spectrum, if I, uh, like a, um, a UV spectrum. If I average over a certain interval, I've lost, uh, I've sampled the distribution, the underlying distribution in a very different way. I've changed the information content. Um, so one of the, one technique that we, that we use is to actually compress the numbers themselves. So um, I want to, uh, if I want to return a number of counts per accumulation that goes up to about 65,000, um, I need 16 bits in the machine to do that. Um, but if we can find a way to compress that into 8 bits, I'm immediately halving my data volume requirement. I can immediately get twice as much data back. Um, the question is, of course, is that a good thing to do? It might not be a good thing to do for a particular application, but um, we can do that. So um, I'm going to show you how that works, and then we will, I guess, we'll break for coffee. So the basic idea is that um, we return exactly the same number up to a certain limit. So um, this is the top, top row in each of these is what I measure. This is, say, a number of counts in a particular bin. So I measure zero counts, or I measure five, or I end up with 33. And then I want to compress that down so it occupies less space. So what I can do is I can say, well, OK, I measure zero, I will return a zero. I measure three, I will turn a th return a three. But that only works up to a certain, um, a certain value. If I, so I get to eight and I return an eight, but then I measure a nine, well, actually, I'm going to say that's eight, and I'm going to return an eight. I do 10, I measure 10, I'll say, okay, 
let's return that as nine, and you keep going. But the point is that you get coarser and coarser as the number gets higher. So when you're up to, I measure 35, I'm going to return 17. I measure 36, I'm going to return 17. 37, I'm going to return 17, and so on. The point of that is that this, this number is, takes up less bits than this number. But when you re do the inverse operation, you only know that it's, it could be 34. That's all you can get out of it. Um, so that is, I, I, that is exact. I've not, if I measure 34 with this scheme, I get 34 back when I, rec when I do the inverse operation on the ground. But the inverse operation isn't exact. So if I measure 39 on the spacecraft, on the ground, I still only have 34. So that's an error of five now. That's a systematic error of five counts. Um, can't get it back. You can't un unpack that any further. Um, so if we looked at this on a, on a, on a graph, and again, I'm going to do this in the, um, in the practical session. There's a little exercise to play with this in the practical session. This is what was measured on board from naught and, and, and up to 255 counts. That occupies eight bits. And I can compress that down to five bits using this particular scheme. So you can see here how it, it's uh, exactly the same up to eight. And then we start to, to saturate off. And so you end up with a, a large error. By the time you get up here, you end up with quite a large error. Um, so again, if I'm subtracting that, if I'm saying um, up at the, the peak of my distribution where the counts are fairly high, I've got then a a potential error that's quite large, but it also gives me some uncertainty on what the actual value is that I need to take into account. So I guess I'll stop there and we'll break for coffee. Yeah? 30. 30. Cool. All right. Thank you.